Well, Uncle Dan. What? Ah, hey, yes? You know that, uh, that here in Utah, we are constantly reminded that things are not secret, they are sacred. <laughs> that is <laughs> true. Right. But keep them secret, because they're right. secret. But don't talk about them, Yes, because free agency is the most precious gift you have. You must never use it. <laughs> and, 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 you, and you know who uh, in this room is, was most indoctrinated into that idea? The, the, our very, the, the secret Uncle Doug or the sacred Uncle Doug? One we, and the same. I don't know, because I can't talk about it. Right. Well, well uncles, we often, uh, on this show, we slay other people's sacred cows. So yeah. I thought, in an act of solidarity, I would come here today and slay one of my own. Oh. Oh. Um, you brought a cow I into the studio. I brought a cow to slaughter. Really? Um, as frequent listeners of this podcast will surely know, I have an unhealthy affinity for the King James Version of the Bible over all the others. Uh-oh. 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 Good one. <laughs> I thought that today we could explore why that is and talk about the King James Version itself. Okay. So let's start with a little bit about why I prefer this version. Um, And our ex-Mormon listeners will know and some frequent listeners will know. It turns out that the King James Version is the official version of the Mormon Church. Yes. Mm. In which we three all grew up. The official English version. That's correct. And Um, and so far, prior to the segment, it has been... mm. The official Bible of the How to Heritage. That's right. <laughs> at least, at least I think so. Yes, I've been uh, I've been pushing bucking that trend. I know you have. Yeah. When um, I think that Wonder Bible TM <laughs> should be the official Bible. <laughs> dot are you of the How to Heritage? <laughs> um, the fact that this is the Mormon Church's official Bible mostly comes from the fact that it was the version that teenage Joseph Smith had in his upstate New York house. Um, Joseph recounts while reading this version of the Bible, um, he read the Epistle of James, chapter one, verse five, which says. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. So this prompted Joseph to go find a grove to ask God which of the many churches was true, which God decided to answer in person. Of oh course, this is only one of the many versions of this account, but we'll leave that for another day. If you're Mormon, you have heard that story over so yeah, many times. Over. Yeah. Matter of fact, that just that version, that uh, scripture, scripture. Yeah. Is it's so almost triggering, isn't it? It's like yeah. it's like DNA level. Yeah, I know that sure. scripture. I don't know what the word upbraideth means, <laughs> but yeah. I know that word. But if you if you say that, it's it's like the Manchurian candidate thing. It's a post hypnotic <laughs> suggestion. If you say it to a, an ex Mormon anywhere in the world, they suddenly become very reverent. <laughs> <laughs> they fold their arms. Yeah. So in any case, the King James Version is basically fundamental to the Mormon religion. Um, now, Joseph would go on to incorporate, uh, read, plagiarize huge sections of the King James Version into the Book of Mormon. This would produce what is one hey, of my... Hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix exactly it. Exactly right. This would produce what, one of my favorite things about the King James Version. It's that Joseph copied several mistakes and misrepresentations or mistranslations that existed in the copy of the King James Version into the Book of Mormon. <laughs> Oopsie! <laughs> so, uh, back in episode 34, we covered the story of Nephi and the Brass Plates. In summary, a Jewish family that would become the ancestors of all Native Americans all the way back in 600 BCE were commanded to steal a set of brass plates upon which were written the books of the Old Testament. Right. According to Joseph, anywhere in the Book of Mormon that they're quoting the Old Testament Bible, it's from those ancient records they stole in 600 BCE. Ah, okay. Okay, there are too many to chronicle here, but for a complete list of these mistranslations, I would direct listeners to the CES letter by Jeremy Runnels which is something we definitely should talk about sometime on this show. Yeah. Um, But basically, in the 19th century, a 4th century manuscript was discovered called the Sinaitic Syriac, which predated the versions of those same texts used by the translators of the King James Version. And this was the first Bible to talk about weed allergies. (laughs) Right? (laughs) I'm Um, following. I'm totally following, yeah. Um, The translation of this earlier document shows several errors and mistranslations in the King James Version, which found their way right into the Book of Mormon. Yeah. Uh, some well, of, that'll happen. Yeah. Some of these changes are minor and cosmetic, and some change the meaning or reverse the meaning entirely of some verses. Wow. He to she, up to down, that kind of thing. Oh. So does it seem unlikely that the plates of brass would have, this, the, the, would have contained the same translation errors as the 1769 version of the 1611 translation of the Bible <laughs> written in ornate 17th century English? 
Yeah, it does. It seems all oh, it makes a sense. And you know, the, when you're when you see you just see miracles everywhere. That's right. <laughs> in, in life, don't you? It's just beautiful. All, all this is to say that the King James version essentially disproves the Book of Mormon. So that's there you go. Interesting. Yeah. Um, as a, As an added bonus, if you happen to be a, happen to be a MAGA hat wearing shit stain trying to intimidate a Native American Vietnam vet, <laughs> blissfully unaware that with any luck you have destroyed your future and are smiling no more as you stare down a long and miserable life of humiliation and penury, according to Mormons, you can check the box for anti-Semitism on your worst living person checklist <laughs> as well. <laughs> but I digress. So anyway, back to the story. Something tells me that box is checked. Yeah, no they, doubt. They don't, they don't need any extra <laughs> help. By the time this comes out, if you haven't seen this in the news... <laughs> You've seen it. You've seen it. Um, before we go on a bit more about why I'm so hung up on this version, let's talk about the King James Version and how it came to pass... Um, <laughs> That's all we <you> did there. <laughs> uh, the King James Version, or as it's very commonly known, the authorized version was commissioned by King James VI in 1604. Indeed. In the late 16th century, there were several Engl- English versions of the Bible floating around Protestant circles, most prominently the Bishop's Bible, the Tyndale Bible, the Coverdale Bible, the Matthew Bible, the Great Bible, the Geneva Bible, the Taverner's Bible, and the Dewey Realms Bible, among others. Whoa. Um, some of these versions were some of these were versions of each other. Some were translated directly from the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek manuscripts, themselves translations and copies of earlier versions and translations, each pushing their own agenda or a particular doctrine. Uh, most of the differences in these versions were so minor and esoteric that you would require a PhD to decipher them. But at the time, people killed over them. Sure. Um, the Puritans in England, which had a great deal of power in the Church of England, but were generally hated. Please listen back to episode 61 to hear how much fun they were. We're not satisfied with any of the current translations. King James also felt uh, that current versions put too much emphasis on the individual membership aspect of Christianity and not on the leadership. So using words like congregation rather than ordained clergy bothered King James himself, who Uh as a king wanted more emphasis on the leadership side of things. So in 1604, he convened the Hampton Court Conference which sounds like a gathering of medical device salespeople in Des Moines, but was actually where 47 scholars were to produce the new version of the Bible that not only satisfied King James, the Puritans, various other sects of the Church of England, but was expressly to be heavy on style. Yes. So think of it as the Blade Runner 2049 of Bibles. <laughs> so the Council... Yeah, Hampton Court is lovely, by the way, if you've <laughs> ever been there. I, have, I don't know if I've been I mean, I've been to England, London, but I don't know anyway. I have been to Hampton Court, yeah. I, I think we all have to go now. I've stayed at a Hampton Court. That's, uh, that is a different thing. <laughs> it, it's like a La Quinta. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the council broke into six groups, each given a section of the Bible to translate from the assembled sources and other versions of the Bible. Then they would each submit their section to each other for review. This led to many shortcuts in the translation. Like, for example, they took 14 different uh, Hebrew words and condensed them all to the one word in English, prince. Yeah, you know what? If you want accuracy, the best way to get there yeah, exactly. is committee yeah exactly. and it's it's like writing an exquisite corpse exactly right it's just b- madness somehow yeah. what came out of this insane process was not the ford edsel but <laughs> the most influential and best-selling book in the english language so the printing of the book became a huge battle between the major uh printing houses in england which persists to this day <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's still bad blood between english printing houses over the bible um, and this was all done before the English spelling was standardized. Right. So different printers you made changes in order to have even margins. Mostly what they would do is change U's to V's or use long F's instead of final S's in places and then several other little tweaks. So, yeah. Um, then there that's, were up- That's what you did. That's what you did. Again, accuracy. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, updated versions of this book were then produced in 1760, 62, 63, and 1769, Mostly these versions did things like get rid of all the extra letters in the arcane English of 1611. Think ye olde shoppy versus ye old shop. Yeah. However, it was the last version that found its way from Oxford to upstate New York, where the son of a dirt farmer would eventually copy huge sections into the world's first and yet still worst choose your own adventure novel, (laughs) which explains why Mitt Romney is the junior senator from Utah. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. Makes perfect sense. That is a straight line, motherfuckers. At some point, I don't know if you're going to get into it. Are you going to get... You probably don't even... Wouldn't have run it. It's so archaic. Mm. But there's this Shakespeare connection. Are you going to get to that at all? Uh, Not... Well, uh, go ahead. Because it's one of those... uh, Now is probably the wrong time, but I did want to mention that, like, there's this whole... Shakespeare was in 
King James employee at exactly. that time. And there's all this theory that maybe he worked on this Bible. And there's a, there's and he a, punched it up. N- well, maybe. <laughs> but the, there's one particularly fun theory about Psalm 46. Mm. Because in 1611, Shakespeare was 46 years old, maybe. Uh, and so he, so Shakespeare was 46 years old. And then, so he's working on Psalm 46. And if you count in, I think, 46 letters from the beginning of the chapter and then 46 letters from or words from the end of the chapter, you get the word shake and the word spear. No shit. Really? Yeah. A little conspiracy fun for you. Oh, that's fun. A little Dan Brown level. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Fun. Um, now, one might argue that the, these minor tweaks wouldn't have any effect on the main thrust of the story such as the crystal clear narrative of the story of Samson, as we covered in episode 21. (laughs) Right. But you might want to ask the children of Ireland in the 1600s if there were any real-world consequences from the mistranslation of young maiden to young virgin. Right. Oh, Um, shit. But for me, as a young man reading the Bible in the Book of Mormon, one written in Shakespearean English and one desperately trying to sound like it was, this was the Bible, right? This was how it sounded to me at the time. I remember it just, that it sounded... Um, I don't know if it gave it a gravity and a solemnity, solemnity that made it sound more credible. Um, even now, when I, I read other versions of the Bible, it just doesn't feel right. So, for example, listen to John 3.16 in the King James Version versus the message. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Versus, this is how much God loved the world. He gave his Son, his one and only Son. And this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. That second one sounds like Christopher Walken summarizing <laughs> the first one. <laughs> exactly. While he gave his son. Hey! Yeah. Um, wow. Can, can I just say, though, that the message is the most kooky bananas. I completely agree. Version. It's, it's, it's the a hippie Bible. And I well, knew no, you were going to come at me with this. It's, it, it's delightful. <laughs> yeah. But it's not a translation. No. It's a, but it's, so how about Psalm 23.4? In the King James Version versus the Living Bible. Okay. Yea, though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Um, and then versus the Living Bible. Even when walking through the dark valley of death, I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me, guarding, guiding all the way. Eh, it's eh, not yeah. terrible, but it sounds wrong. Yeah, you're right. It's the, the, the ye olde. <clears throat> yeah. It just, sounds like the Bible. Right. That's how God talked. Now, on top of all of that... There is an inherent absurdity to the King James Version that makes reading it now as an atheist even more hilarious. Yeah. Listen back to episode 9 when we discuss Leviticus or episode 58 and 60 when we discuss the book of Revelation. Reading other versions of the Bible would be like if Monty Python and the Holy Grail were written and produced and starring Kevin James. It just <laughs> isn't as good. Right. The Kevin James Bible, by the way, is a fantastic <laughs> translation. <laughs> However, although I am and always have been partial to the King James Version, I am not unaware of how fucking hard it is to read sometimes. Listeners will know how often I stumble and struggle with it. I always have. Um, Uncle Mark and Dan have to watch me do it. (laughs) So in the spirit of this podcast, which is dedicated to exploring life on the outside of religion, I am prepared to make some news today. Oh, no. Uh I have decided to experiment with other Bibles. Oh, you (laughs) dirty, dirty bird. Uh That's right. You're hearing it here first. We haven't sent out the press release yet. Well, since you're so biblically versed, what... What what is it in uh, in the Old Testament where it says, "Let us go away together and worship other gods"? <laughs> exactly that you have broken that <laughs> solemn. So you know, I I took to heart what it says in First Corinthians thirteen. When I was a child, I spake as a child; I understood as a child; I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Or as it says in the the same scripture in The Voice, when I was a child, I spoke, thought, reasoned like a child, as we all do. But when I became a man, I left my childish ways behind. For now we can only see a dim and blurry picture of things as when we stare into polished metal. I realize that everything I know is only part of a big picture. But one day, when Jesus comes, we will see clearly face to face. Okay, so that gets to a really great point. Yeah. Which is to... Your workaday person out in the world. Yeah. So let's talk about, you know, like our parents, Doug. Yeah. What the, what the gist of that scripture is, is the second thing you read. Right. Right. But reading it in the King James Version gives it this veneer of, it gives it a gravitas. Right. And, a, and a, it, for people who don't read poetry or people who don't read 
uh, you know, great works of literature, there's there's a sense of something profound about it yep. and mysterious, but it's just ancient English. Exactly. It's just weird old English. And well, it's and it's it, not nece- it's not profound. No. It was written by a group of men who who were schooled in letters and who were, you know, their their whole job was the crafting of words. Yeah. So it was written well, but it's not written for accuracy. It's not written for uh for you know, they tried to make sure that it was a it was a good translation, but they also ha- were trying to appease Yeah. Ten different factions, exactly, and they were arguing with each other f- over what words should be used in this place because that you know the Puritans want this word, but the the more the, you know the other groups want this word, and the Catholics will never go for it if it doesn't have this word, right, right, and to please a fancy ass king who's writing the checks. But it, right. yeah, but these were political decisions, right? These were not decisions based on like what's the most accurate representation totally. of this but, ancient language. But one directive they also had was make it sound good. Good. Like yeah, make it you know, make, but you it, t- make it sing. You take my point that to the modern oh, ear, yeah. it sounds poetic. Well, and it was probably written poetically, right? But it's but it's more. It sounds more poetic than it even is. Yeah. Hence, why our Joseph Smith wrote his book in the 1830s to sound like it was written in the 1610s. He might not have been aware there were other versions of the Bible. I mean, he probably was. Exactly right. Like, But the King James was the Bible of the Puritans in North, uh, northern New York at the time. But and, it was also, like, yeah, that. but that kind of, like, funny talk, old-timey funny mm-hmm. talk, was, was how a religious text sounded exactly. in his ear. So, right. he wrote, so he wrote his book to sound like it, even though it makes zero sense to do that. Exactly. Right. And to, it's the same as the, the phenomenon where Americans will tack 20 IQ points onto anybody with an English accent. Right. <laughs> right. That's basically what this is. It sounds profound. Right. I mean, maybe not since the Brexit vote, but yeah. like yeah. before that. Yeah. Uh-huh. We've, we've, with the exchange rate now, we've taken <laughs> 10 points back. So. Now, I don't know what version I'm going to try out first. Um, there's on the... Uh, what is it? BibleGateway.com. There's mm-hmm. 59 versions in English alone. God. On NPR, only days ago, they interviewed a scholar named Robert Alter who had just unveiled his three volume translation of the Hebrew Bible. Yes. That took him over 24 years to translate. That he hand wrote. Hand wrote. And he undertook this effort because he claims that the existing English Bibles don't do justice to the original literary beauty of the Hebrew. Right. Um, and, and he said there's, there's massive uh, errors the even beautiful, now. <laughs> the beautiful melodic sound of Hebrew. <laughs> He said there's there's even, uh, like, for example, uh, there is no Hebrew equivalent to the word soul. His closest approximation is life breath, which you can see could mean very much a different thing. Mm. And I love this. He changed, thou anointest my head with oil to, you moisten my head with oil. <laughs> Why? It matters. Because it's good. <laughs> I know. Because it's more of an, a lotion-y sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, right. It's exactly a... right. That's what he said. <laughs> really? Yeah. It's a, it was a dry skin issue. It, it was, was kind of sacred about it. It's like, you got a dry skin. They were all in the desert. What are you going <laughs> to yeah. do? So, dear listeners, <laughs> you will in the future be treated to, uh, to listening to me awkwardly and angrily try out different versions of the Bible, like a recently divorced middle-aged straight man going all in on Grinder. I hope you're happy. <laughs> well, this is exciting news. This, this is, is a, this is momentous. A paradigm shift here at the Heretics. <laughs> big so, stuff. Uh, so. Big big stuff. Look look for new and exciting bullshit in the future from different Bibles. <laughs> yes, indeed. All well, right. uh, with that with that courageous stance from Uncle Doug, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> 